Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. I hope you all had a great time yesterday and got to meet some new people, hopefully people from across the globe. You know, we're really excited to have attendees from Australia, the UK, France, Canada. It's, it's incredible. So thank you all again so much for being here, for being engaged and participating. Give yourselves a round of applause. It's just amazing everything you guys have been doing here. Now we have a special activity for you all this morning. Get you guys a little, a little engaged. You have a little pop quiz ready for you. Led by the one, the only, let's give it up for Dana Gunders. Good morning, everyone. Um, all right, we're going easy on you. Some of you may have done this quiz before, but here's how it works. Everyone needs to stand up, please. It is the honor system. And as we go through, you gotta think about what the answer might be. If you get it right, you stay standing. If you do not, you sit down. So here we go, without further ado. We're gonna see how much y'all have learned. I know how to do this. Next. Aha. All right. Getting warmed up here. About how many days past the sell-by date can you eat eggs? None that's gross. Three to five. Ten to twenty. Or twenty to thirty-five. Oh. Ten to twenty. Some will say up to three weeks. Some will say three to five. But we're going with C here. Okay, but let's just say you weren't quite sure, so you put the egg in a bowl of water. You know it is still good to eat if it floats or if it sinks. If it sinks. All right. But let's just say it floated. So you toss it. How long of a shower in minutes could you have taken with the water it took to produce that egg? 5, 11, 25, 40. 11. Average shower, one egg. Okay, but what if instead of an egg, you threw out a hamburger? How many minutes of showering then? 90. Oh my gosh, you guys are dropping like flies. You're my people. Okay, but let's just say that instead of a hamburger, you threw out all the turkey that gets thrown out over Thanksgiving. How many times could you drive from New York to San Francisco with the same number of greenhouse gas emissions as the amount of turkey that gets thrown out over Thanksgiving? About 800,000 times. All right, we're going to switch it up here. Is anyone still standing? I can't see very well up here. Oh, I got a couple. Do we have a winner? Oh, my God, this is amazing. All right, well, let's see if she makes it. Um, all right, this is the last one. What has happened to the calories in the average cookie since the 1980s? Have they doubled, tripled, quadrupled, or stayed the same? They have quadrupled. So watch your cookies, people. All right, that's what we got. Thank you. Wait, what is the name of our champion? I... <laughs> All right, let's find you later. And with that, I would like to introduce our investment session for the morning. Um, to get us going here, I'd like to introduce... Alex Corey, she is our amazing VP of Capital Innovation and Engagement. If you don't know her, you should. And come on up, Alex, welcome. Thank you very much. Wonderful, hello everyone, welcome. Um, I definitely have taken that quiz too many times and I still can't remember all of the answers, so kudos to that woman in the back. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with you all today. I'm super excited to be introducing today's morning session focused on the ever important topic of capital. 
capital is really important, as we all will know, in terms of the adoption and scaling of food waste solutions across the food system. Um, as Dana mentioned, my name is Alexandria Corey. I am our VP of Capital Innovation and Engagement at Refed. Now, if you know me, um, you know that myself and the team spend a lot of time thinking about and working to help mobilize more of this important capital into the sector. Whether that is coming from more of your traditional mature sources of capital, like venture capital or private equity, that can be from the steadily increasing and uber important catalytic capital set, including public funding and philanthropic funding. And it can even be from corporates, which we don't think a lot about corporates as capital providers, but they do play a really important role because every day, they are thinking about how to spend their resources internally to build out processes and solutions or partnering externally, as many of you in the room will know as they're on their way towards reaching their goals around sustainability and climate. At Refed, we believe that investing in food waste solutions is at an inflection point. That in spite of some of the geopolitical and economic um, realities that we're facing right now, there's some pretty clear tailwinds that really show that investing in this sector right now has never been more important, more needed, and frankly, from my personal perspective, more exciting. Um, from all the public funding that you heard Dana mention yesterday that's coming into this space, to what we're seeing via Refed's capital tracker, that since 2016, for instance, philanthropic funding has more than doubled in our space, and on the private investment side, it has increased more than sevenfold in that same period of time. Exciting, but that said, we know that food loss and waste accounts for about 8% of greenhouse gas emissions globally, and we are nowhere near to getting that same share of funding in our space yet. So there's still a lot more need, there's still a lot more opportunity. With that reality in mind, we wanted to design today's session to really focus on what the future of financing in our sector holds for us, um, specifically as it intersects with this growing climate movement and as there's a steepening understanding of just the role, the important role that food waste can play in reducing methane emissions specifically, it's one of the most important levers that we have in terms of reducing that impact on the climate for our ecosystems and our communities. So you're gonna hear two sessions this morning. We really jam packed them in here, so we'll see if we can stay on time. In the first panel discussion, you're gonna hear from some early stage climate investors talking about what brings them to the topic of food waste as an investment space. And then the second panel, we're gonna invite up some um, really industry leading experts on all things carbon credits, which is something that I'm very excited about learning more. Um, they're gonna talk about the potential for a carbon credit market in our space, and really the ability for that to create financial incentives that help to accelerate and finance climate activities across the entire food supply chain. So with that, let me introduce you to our moderator for the session. Um, she is a food reporter at Bloomberg News. She's also been at Quartz and BuzzFeed and Fortune over the last 10 years. And a lot of her work is really focused on examining the impact that food has on our environment, health, workers, and animals. So with that, please welcome Dina Shanker and all of our panelists to the stage. Hi, thank you so much. On? Yes, okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and um, really excited to learn more. Uh, this has been just great. I've learned so much uh, since I've been here since yesterday. So thank you so much. Uh, on the panel today, we have Christiana Lee, a senior associate at King Philanthropies. We have uh, Eric Turner, a general partner at Drawdown Fund, and Brian Hallweil, a strategic associate. Um, he focuses on innovations that speed the transition to regenerative agriculture. So we're gonna start with a pretty general question, which is why invest in food waste solutions when you're looking at uh, climate-related investments? I'll start quickly, and I, <clears throat> so we are, at the Drawdown Fund, we're climate tech investors very broadly. Uh, we invest across food and ag, 
sustainable city, as we call it, and energy. Um, and, and I use that because I think the reason why we invest in food waste solutions is, according to Project Drawdown and all the research out there, it is one of the it is the biggest causer of climate change uh, and emissions. And also, when you look at it in terms of the investment context, it's possibly one of the most scalable uh, solutions that you can address out there. You know, you look at energy and some of the high capital needs to put in renewable energy projects and other things, whereas something like food waste is, is massive impact and very, very scalable. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of you know, good investment opportunities in this space because of that. Great. Um, I can go. So King Philanthropies focuses on this intersection between mitigating climate change, so really targeting GHG emissions and improving livelihoods, especially for the world's poorest people. And so food waste lies at a very obvious um, in middle of that intersection. From a mitigating climate standpoint, like Eric said, it's one of the best solutions that we have. And for the world's poorest people, we know that there's more than enough food on this earth to feed everybody, but there's still 800 million people who are malnourished and food insecure. So for us, food waste is a matter of life and death. I would agree with um, Eric and Christina, and uh, the specific area that I focus most on is investing at the farm end of the food chain, the upstream end. Um, and although I would agree uh, with the sentiment of the event that food waste thinking, food waste investing has been mainstreamed, I do think we're still neglecting it at the farm end. That may be because in North America, we don't have as much waste there, or it's not as easy to target as at the retail end, at the consumer end, or in processing. Um, and I would say that's not surprising because ag tech adoption has been slow, ag tech investing has been slow. Uh, seven years ago when I started doing this full time, we talked about farm tech and ag tech investing being in the first inning. We're in the first inning of that, uh, baseball town reference. Um, people are still saying that seven years later. We're still in the first inning. So it's fairly slow moving, even though farmers are avid adopters of innovation. Um, and what I'm mostly excited about and where I think we are gonna see this mainstreaming moving back upstream is when companies like Winnow and, um, and Evergrain and Afresh, when they really thrive and grow, uh, they're going to be pushing the thinking about food waste in both directions. Uh, so as Evergrain grows, more and more barley in the food chain um, will be affected by Evergrain's efforts to reduce waste and get a second use for that barley. And the data from Winnow uh, and Afresh will be fed you know, to grocers, but also back to fruit and vegetable growers who realize they, they can reduce their production. So. Um, I wish I could report some interesting climate and food waste innovations at the farm end of the chain, but I think we're, we're a little behind right now. Great. Well, uh, I have a St. Louis family, and we're Cardinals fans, so I'm going to just continue with the baseball analogy here for a sec. Where do you think the biggest hits in the first inning have been, and what are you looking to see in the second and third innings? <laughs> Um, you know, again, uh, maybe a counter answer. Um, I've been disappointed at carbon markets at the farm end so far. Uh, I've spoken to a number of farmers who, at scale, who've looked into um, selling carbon from their acreage, and the, the price they're being offered is fairly low. So they're, low, and they're putting it down their priority list. Um, that market is still developing. I, I do think it has a ton of potential. It will develop, and that price will be more stable. Uh, but I'm not, not, seeing, not seeing a lot there. Um, I am pretty excited about some innovations to reduce uh, ag inputs and waste when it comes to ag inputs. Some of the innovation we've seen in farm software and hardware uh, has the goal of you know, dramatically reducing pesticide and fertilizer use, even if you're not shifting farmers away from that entirely. Uh, so there, there are some big gains to uh, there in terms of reducing waste. Um. I'd have to say, I feel like a lot of the initial innovation has been in the supply chain, kind of where Brian mentioned, whether it's software technology, self shelf life extension, new packaging, um, things to address the supply chain, because that's really where you can tie the, the ROI, you know, with, without losing waste there, it's, you know, pretty direct bottom line benefit to a lot of the big companies that are operating there. They, 
um, they can still sell the food when it eventually gets to the, the grocery store and ultimately the consumer. Um, but I, I would like to see more done at the consumer level because that is where a lot of the waste happens. So how can you build business models that drive ROI um, but also encourage consumers to adopt uh, you know, more food-friendly trends? Yeah, I think it's pretty crazy that most of the food that we waste is at the consumer level and just pure education and, and raising awareness can make a huge impact. Um, for King Philanthropies this year, we've really taken a stake in shelf life extension technologies. Um, one of the companies uh, that we invested in this year, Ripe, um, they're creating these new biomimicry stickers. So you can put a sticker on your fruit, the clamshell of the fruit, and it'll extend the shelf life of it for up to 14 days. Um, more similarly with fruit coatings and then um, just outside, abroad, in developing countries, the issues are just so much further up the value chain. Um, food doesn't get to consumers' plates in the first place. And so we see a lot of technologies in just refrigeration, even as simple as ice that you can put vinegar or salt on, things like that. We really need to scale those solutions that are readily available to us in the U.S. in these emerging markets. Great. And so what role do you see capital playing here, um, especially when we're talking about how much happens at the consumer level? Um, how can capital uh, change consumer behavior? How can capital really uh, fix these problems in the supply chain? Um, yeah, I mean, I so as climate tech investors, and we've been doing this at the Drawdown Fund for almost five years now. Um, We've seen a lot of capital coming into the space, and it's the hot trend, and this is, you know, climate tech is where everybody wants to be. But I think when we started five years ago, we started with the belief that, you know, financial returns and climate returns are linked. Sustainability equals efficiency, and there should be gains, and there should be good business models out there that are not philanthropic based or, you know, again, back then when everybody talked about impact investing, it was concessionary returns or philanthropy or a grant or, how, you know, how do you give money away to make these, you know, businesses start up and solutions work, which there still is a very important part for that in the system. But we started our fund with the idea that, you know, private equity funds and venture capital funds can be used to address these solutions in ways that are building profitable and sustainable companies as well. Um, and so I think there is a, a huge role to play for capital in driving ROI positive businesses um, that can support anybody kind of across the supply chain. And that's where I think the unique thing that we look for in a lot of the businesses are how are you driving that value and are you finding the right person in this supply chain? Because another thing that everybody talks about with food waste is it is consumer driven but you know, you're not paying a consumer or anything to, to reduce their food waste. It's you got to be able to hit the right spot in the supply chain or in the value chain and drive return to that person. And that's the way the solutions are going to get up and get started and off the ground. And you know, so if it's in the supply chain, how do you make that more efficient? Can you change mode of transportation to save costs you know, by extending shelf life? Or is there a packaging that will actually drive a financial benefit but also reduce food waste at the same time. And so being able to connect the dots between efficiency from a financial perspective and sustainability is important. Yeah, I mean, a big picture, the way that capital can, you know, help advance all of our goals are, you know, one, providing the money to scale up these businesses, um, you know, the, the fuel to put on top of the fire, so to speak, um, but also because investors are going to you know, stay on top of these companies, um, not just giving them assistance in terms of hiring and organization, everything they do need to do to be successful, but they're going to keep the pressure on. So it's a type of incentive that's different than government support or public support. Um, the other trend that's worth really pointing out for anyone in the room who's raising money um, or, or, or looking, um, you know, looking to get uh, to, to, to raise investment is there is this sort of melding of climate investors and food and ag investors. Um, there's not that many food and ag focused investors uh, and now all of a sudden there's a lot of climate focused investors who are starting to play in the food and ag space which is great actually and you know it, it's making the space larger and across the board uh, 
private equity groups and venture funds are talking more about impact. A fair bit of that is greenwashing, but lots more of them are putting out impact reports. So if you're a startup, if you're a community group, if you're raising money and you can talk about your impact, uh, that's, you know, that's going to be um, you know, immediately of interest uh, to, to folks who are, uh, you know, who are investing money these days. Um, it's interesting when we started to think about integrating climate into our mission. Um, we used to look at impact investing as kind of like a houseboat, so not a great house, not a great boat, not great on the returns, and then if you focus on the returns, not great on the impact. And where we've seen that change is really climate tech and, and these food waste issues and issues that are both impact and also just a reality for us today. And so. Um, now that we do more impact investments and we also do grants, I think, and I, and I also have other friends in VC who are just interested in climate tech for the sake of it being a good business, I'd really like to see this space um, think further and, and bigger um, internationally. And so a lot of our organizations or companies that we funded this year, they are just in the U.S. today um, and, and they are going to be for a little bit. But if in 10, 15 years we can see that scale and the founders can start with a vision to take it abroad, there's a huge market for it. I know emerging markets are, are risky, but there's a huge opportunity there. So we've seen in the past, uh, in the past years uh, a lot of investment going into the space. Uh, my understanding is this conference itself keeps growing. There's a lot more awareness of these problems. Um, I, I've spoken to businesses myself that are taking a new found interest in reducing their food waste. It feels like there's so much momentum towards reducing food waste, but according to ReFed's data, food waste is going up per capita um, and in total. And I'm wondering what do you guys think is the, is the big barrier here and is capital how much of a role does capital have, um, or is it something else? I think there's just a lot of inertia in the food system. There, there's a lot of inertia in how we produce food. There's a lot of inertia in how we eat food. And so um, I feel anecdotally people are making all sorts of changes. Uh, you see signage at grocery stores talking about reducing waste. Restaurants are getting on board and plenty of consumers are, uh, but uh, these are, you know, habits that are slow to change is, is maybe the simple explanation. Um, I do also feel that efforts need to scale up, and that's going to take a few years. I mean, two quick examples. Uh, the company Divert, who is here, uh, you know, ra recently raised a lot of money to build additional capacity to, you know, essentially rescue food waste from grocery stores, turn that into fuel. Um, you know, this is not a small effort, and, you know, there's actual trucks involved and, uh, you know, big fleets of trucks and factories that need to be built, and so that takes time. Uh, one other example is, is a company named uh, Galley Solutions, which Astonor Ventures is a, is a lead investor in. Um, Galley uh, is a re recipe engine, uh, primarily for food service. Um, and multi-unit restaurants and helps them optimize their recipes to improve two things, uh, lower cost and reduce waste. Um, so food waste has been part of their mission for a long time. Um, a year or two ago, uh, their business was 10 times smaller than it is today. They onboarded a lot of customers. So all of a sudden they're having a lot more impact, but that's just taking time. Um, and and What's significant also about Galley is there are some other competitors that aren't optimizing for reducing food waste. And so that's an evolution that's also happening. I think in the U.S. our systems are set up to waste right now, whether it's over-consuming, over-producing, the way that we buy things in bulk, the way that we only go to the grocery store once a week and then eat out a lot and forget about the food at home or, or whatever it may be. I think those problems look a lot different in developing countries and emerging markets. Um, up to 50% of the food that is produced in sub-Saharan Africa and low-income countries are wasted and they never make it to the consumer plate. And so farmers work really hard to grow the food and it's their livelihood and it's their income. It's their ability to send their children to school and it, it's their whole life, yet it doesn't reach the people in the markets that it needs. And so 
like I said, like really simple technologies that are actually really hard to implement, like refrigeration, cold chain. Um, one of our grantees, Cold Hubs, they're doing solar powered cold storage facilities so that that 14 hour commute from um, the north of Nigeria where they grow a lot of the food to the south where the market is so that half of that food doesn't go to waste. They can keep it, they can sell it for longer. Farmers can bargain for higher prices and that income is what allows them to send their children to school. And so just to see more innovation um, and more capital and market development happen in this space. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add, Brian kind of touched on it, I do think there's a lot going on. It's just, you know, going to take time to filter into the system, and it's great to see how this conference keeps growing, how the interest in the space keeps growing, how investment funds like ours keep making these investments, but it might be a couple of years before they start to truly scale to that impact. So, yes, there's definitely a lot more we could be doing, and I think there's a lot more needed to be done, but... I also think some of the, the fruits of what we're, what we're sowing right now will be realized three years from now, five years from now. It's just going to take a little yeah. time. When you're looking at an investment, what is your time frame for seeing a return? So for us, it is shorter term. We are growth equity investors, so we underwrite investments over a three to five year period. Um, we target businesses with five to 50 million in current revenue. Um, so a lot of the investments that are being made from other slightly earlier stage funds in the climate space are, you know, probably longer duration, seven years to nine years, depending on where you, you know, you are as a seed stage, series A stage, series B stage. Um, but I would also align that with us as growth investors, we are just starting to see some of these food waste businesses hit our threshold of five to 50 million in revenue, which is great when they get there. Um, but as we kind of sit here waiting for those companies to come to us, we do see a lot of innovation in the seed series A stage that is, you know, on the cusp of getting to us as growth investors. Yeah, from a philanthropic um, capital standpoint, and we, and we also do our impact investments, um, we, we care about time frame and returns, not for the financial reason of it or because we need to make a certain return. But we want to see strong businesses in this space, um, especially in this uh, macroeconomic situation, the ups and the downs, um, we really see that a good business and strong finances can really determine uh, the sustainability of an investment. And then of course, um, beyond that, um, looking for a strong team, looking for a strong impact. Um, we've been really blown away lately about just in these difficult times, teams that stick together and you can really see the difference between companies who have employees that all are sold into the mission and you, you walk into the office space and they all believe in what they're doing and you can feel that and you know in the ups and the downs and the times you have to be financially scrappy or make certain returns. Um, you know those are the kind of teams that are gonna take, take the company to sustainability, especially if there's that long-term vision for impact. So in the US, uh, food waste is largely a problem of overproduction and, um, w and just waste, right? Uh, people throwing food away in their homes um, because they forget about it and so they go to the store and they buy more. Um, it's a problem largely driven by capitalism itself here in the U.S. So is capitalism the, a really a good solution? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question. I, um, <laughs> um, I would say at the farm end, what I'm seeing, um, so there's a very interesting company called Bushel uh, out of North Dakota, which is digitizing grain sales. It's actually a massive problem nationwide. When a grain farmer drops off a load of grain, they get a paper ticket, you know, it might be three to four weeks before the money hits their bank account. So this company, Bushel, is just digitizing all that. But what it's allowing them to do is do better tracking, do better traceability, understand exactly what sort of grain's being dropped off. Um, and they are working in all sorts of eco-incentives. So, you know, a large buyer might want, you know, transitional grain or certified organic grain or uh, grain that's come off a field after a cover crop. Um, and so I could imagine a situation where they are creating some incentives 
uh, you know, a offering a premium uh, so that a farmer can afford to sell less, let's say. Um, but the problem you're talking about, you know, if, if a big cereal company wants to sell just more and more boxes of cereal, um, that means they're going to buy more and more grain. So, you know, that capitalist urge is going to, like, flow throughout the entire food chain. Uh, I don't see an easy way to break that. Um, uh, but when I think about pushing, you know, our investments pushing towards, pushing farmers towards more regenerative practices, uh, it often does come back to two things. One, paying farmers a higher price for what they're selling, and paying them a premium for following those practices, for meeting those goals. Um, or two, reducing the costs that they pay to grow that crop. Um, so we can kind of work it, you know, sort of like work around capitalism with those two incentives, hopefully. Great. Well, I think we're about to uh, finish up. So if I have any uh, last thoughts from Eric or Christiana on capitalism. <laughs> I mean, all I can say is that I, I think that capitalism causes many problems, um, not just in food waste, um, but just to take another angle, um, in developing countries, we know that economic development is the surest way out of extreme poverty. And so on one end, we have capitalism creating surplus and too much. On the other hand, we have not enough market development. And so just to balance those two. And the other thing I would say it's worth pointing out is, you know, a fund like Eric's, uh, a late stage fund, the existence of a fund like Drawdown to focus on this area is a sign of us making a lot of progress. The funds I work with invest much earlier stage. We're looking for a return seven to ten years from now. But we often talk about when the companies we're investing in get bigger, there's not a lot of people to invest and continue to support them. But that's where, you know, later stage funds come in. So that is a real sign. That didn't exist a few years ago. Yeah, and the one thing that I would add to that, too, is that, you know, we like to see more later stage funds like ours that are truly climate aligned, not, you know, a large private equity group that decides to do a private equity fund, which is great. There is so much need for investment in this space that, you know, any dollars going into the growth stage to support the early stage companies is very helpful. Um, but we actually, we tie half of our compensation to the climate underwriting that we do of these businesses and whether they hit their climate targets or not. And, and that dictates a lot of our compensation. So I use that as an example of tying the right incentives in capitalism to, you know, to the outcomes of these businesses, tying incentives to the impact outcomes of the businesses in addition to the financial outcomes of the businesses to us is very important and hopefully, you know, across the system as more you know, impact underwriting and impact tracking and reporting on these things comes to light. I, hopefully the incentives can be aligned with the impact outcomes of the businesses going forward. Great, well, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been great having a chat on a stage in front of lots of people, so thank you. <laughs>
and try and achieve the SDG 12.3, which is still the challenge while we're all here today. Great. Well, thank you. Vera, uh, Karina, we're going to let you start with a bit of uh, explanation and some slides. Um, Vera brings the biggest standard in carbon credit markets right now, so I was hoping you could just uh, teach us all a little bit about that. Sure, and thank you, Dina. And, and I just wanted to say that it's been a truly a, an honor and a pleasure to share with all of you this last couple of days. And before I answer your question, before I, I explain what this all is, I want to briefly share a personal story, partly inspired from the panel yesterday to share our stories and enrich ourselves. And also because it's the reason why I believe carbon markets are a great tool. So before I was working at Vera, I was uh, an entrepreneur pioneering regenerative agriculture in my community. I was enabling sustainable solutions that were previously not available in my community. And despite the good results, despite the media attention and even awards and grants, the struggle for financing was exhausting. I found myself writing proposal after proposal, and this may be some of your cases, and having to hold many jobs to pay salaries, particularly my salary. And so, burned out, I decided to close all initiatives. And this is why I work in carbon markets now. Because carbon markets were designed and have the mission to direct financing to those activities that have great, imp great potential for positive climate impact, but face significant challenges to do so. It enables, it unlocks crucial financing so that they don't have to shut down like I did but can continue to, to, to operate and can even scale up. So how do they do this? And this, is, this answers the, the question. They do this by generating carbon credits that are later sent, um, traded in the voluntary carbon market. So what is a carbon credit? A carbon credit, in short, is a ton of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent removed or reduced from the atmosphere. So projects generate these carbon credits by reducing or removing emissions from the atmosphere. So for example, a mangrove forest that has a distinct ability to keep carbon under the soil, when you don't cut it, then you're not emitting, right? You're reducing emissions by not cutting it. When you reforest a mangrove forest, then you're increasingly removing carbon as it grows. So this is on one hand. On the other hand, this is where I'm gonna use slides because it comes handy. <laughs> are companies, right, that companies should be following this greenhouse gas hierarchy. Ideally, they have a strategy that includes setting science-based targets so that they can first, and you see it in the first on the top, eliminate, avoid emissions. Then they reduce emissions by becoming more efficient. Then they can replace, like, for cleaner technologies. And for those emissions that they cannot avoid or replace, they can compensate through offsets. This means that for those emissions that are hard to reduce or cannot be reduced or replaced at the moment, only for those hard to abate emissions, they can buy carbon credits from projects that benefit from this financing so that can keep going and scale up. So carbon markets enable those who cannot reduce but have the money to transfer the money to those that can reduce and don't have the money to do so. So at Vera, we have many methodologies for many sectors to generate these carbon credits. And now we're soon going to publish one that allows activities that reduce food loss and waste to generate carbon credits and access this financing. Can you talk about what defines a good carbon credit versus a bad one? Sure, um, and thank you for that question. So like in any market, in any sector, there's good quality products and bad quality products. So I personally recommend that you approach the carbon market with healthy skepticism, like you would approach any other important investment and check for certain characteristics that are here. So just for you to know, a VCU is how Vera calls a carbon credit. It stands for Verified Carbon Unit. So it should have all these characteristics. However, I'm going to focus, because of time, I'm going to focus on the two that I consider the most important, which is real and additional. So a carbon credit, in order to be real, it needs to be quantifiable, science-based, and verified by an independent third party. This means that at any 
time at any stage of the process to develop the methodology to create this carbon credit or to know who was behind it at any, any stage, any one person in this room or in the world could access that information because it's transparent and verify independently that the quantification is real. Where it is based, it is based on what science, where is that science coming from, who did it, who funded it? You know, it, all this needs to be super transparent so there's actually, you can see that it is, in fact, real. Uh, and the other is additional. So, like I said before, carbon markets were designed to bring financing to where it's needed the most. And so, carbon markets are just one tool in a big toolbox. And just like tools, they should be, they do their work better when they go to the corresponding task. Carbon markets are supposed to be an interim financing tool as we transfer away from an emission intensive economy, which we are. And so in that sense, it brings money to where it's needed the most. So projects need to demonstrate their additionality by proving, by demonstrating that they have significant financial barriers or significant financial social or cultural barriers that don't allow them to keep up going easily or scale up. And so we're talking about food waste here, of course. Yeah. And so how does uh, carbon crediting work with uh, food loss and waste? Sure. Um, Vera's food loss and waste methodology credits in avoided emissions downstream the food supply chain. This means that the methodology credits avoiding food from rotting at any waste facility and emitting methane, right? Uh, it does not credit shifting food from landfill to compost. It credits that any activity that is diverting food from being discarded and leaving the human food supply chain. And how does it do this? It um, first it measures, it quantifies before any intervention how much has been emitted. So in a business as usual scenario when we're just wasting as much as we always waste, how much is emitted? Then it measures how much is emitted when you implement all these diverting activities that your, your projects are doing. And then the net emission reductions and the difference between those two is what gets credited. Um, the projects that can apply this methodology are any project that is implementing activities to reduce food waste at any stage in the food supply chain. Um, it just needs to demonstrate that it's diverting food from leaving the human food su supply chain, even if it is proving that it's going to feed animals that are gonna be eventually eaten by humans. Um, and the additionality piece for the food and loss waste methodology means that in this case, uh, projects have to demonstrate their significant barriers, that this is not required by law. And so for example, projects that have been going on for more than four years would not be additional unless they can demonstrate that they have not been able to scale up because it hasn't been a revenue or a, a, an income that's continuous and auto-generated, like fi carbon financing can be, or that they are about to shut down unless they get a diverse financing source. Great, thank you. Richard, can you tell us a little bit about what RAP's connection is to this work? Yeah, sure, Dina. So I, I guess the interesting thing about this is that yeah, over the years, we've all talked about the linkage between reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing food waste. We talk about the fact that 8 to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions globally uh, are caused by food loss and waste. And that, if it was a country, it would be the single biggest, and uh, a very smelly, single biggest, uh, third, third biggest emitter on the, on the planet. So when you think about that, what this methodology does is unequivocally link reductions in food loss and waste with carbon reductions and does it in an auditable way. So that's the, that, one of the reasons that RAT was involved and in part funded this work through its project Flawless, which is funded by P4G, was to actually show this link quite clearly and also because it encourages measurement. So again, when we all think about how do we drive change within our organizations, the mantra we think of is target, set clear targets, measure, and act on, on, the, on the measurement information. This methodology encourages measurement at its heart and auditing at its heart. And the third area is how do you drive rapid change? Well, we found that working together through collaborations, through public-private partnerships, for example, Flawless has El Pacto, uh, Pola Comida in, in Mexico, 
It has the South African Pact and it has the, the GRASP Pact in Indonesia, all of which are collaborations of businesses working towards reducing food loss and waste. Well, with a carbon credit, this new reductions can help fuel those collaborations and drive them more rapidly. So that's why we're passionate about this and why we want to be involved. And how does this financing option differ from traditional grant writing or private capital fundraising? I mean, I, I think what it does, as you've heard Karina already say, is it actually directly supports the initiatives involved. So, for example, in the UK, we, ha we, ha we put together a collaboration to increase redistribution of food. That collaboration drove uh, redistribution from 29,000 tonnes per year to nearly 100,000 tonnes per year uh, over a five-year period. Everybody working together towards co a common goal. That's a tripling in the time frame. That could be rewarded with this carbon credit. All that carbon reduction that came out of that massive increase could be rewarded through this approach, which could then fund further developments to get yet more reductions. You know, I started this, why am I in this space? I've always believed that we can achieve halving food loss and waste off the planet which is exactly what we're trying to do through SDG 12.3. This, I think, can help us achieve that. Great, thank you. Um, AC, you have a project that might seek this kind of financing. Um, can you speak a little bit about how this could help you and, and your work from a financing perspective? Yes, of course, thank you, Dina. Um, so I work for a consumer app called Olio that connects households with their neighbors and local businesses so that food that traditionally would be difficult to rescue gets shared, like, for example, three bananas that are getting a bit black, or a sandwich that has an expiry date on the day, or hot food that needs to be redistributed within four hours. By connecting neighbors with each other and within this hyper-local redistribution network, small food items like this one with very short lifespan can be redistributed and consumed. So in our proposition, we solve a big business pain point we build communities, and we divert a lot of food from being wasted. And our solution works. We're currently with 7 million users. We have 120,000 volunteers who have successfully shared 68 million food items, over 26 million doorstep encounters. So that's out of the app. That's people meeting in their households, in their streets, creating communities. But the value of what we do, while it can look obvious from the data standpoint is so difficult to monetize. And one of the most tremendous impact that we're having is environmentally. All this food is not going to waste. So for us, and hopefully for a lot of other businesses in this room, the opportunity to monetize the carbon environmental impact of your work through carbon credits could be a complete game changer that would allow you to get enough revenue to scale and improve and increase your impact within communities, reducing even more food waste. Great, thank you. Um, Richard and, and AC, what do you guys see as the challenges here um, for uh, carbon credits in this sector? Well, I think there are, there are, as ever, always challenges bringing something new into the marketplace. I mean, one of the critical things is this has been deliberately designed to be conservative. So the, what, what, in terms of actually looking at the carbon credit itself, it's actually looking very specifically at one small part of the carbon benefits that we think probably arise from reducing food loss and waste. But to be really, really sure, this is conservative. So it underestimates. OK, that's great because we want confidence in this. That's absolutely key. Confidence is key. The second thing is to make sure that it's verified there's auditing costs. So this might not work for everything. You know, we've got to make absolutely sure that the, the, the reductions that have, have been talked about are actually there and are auditable and we can test that. So it's not for everything, so we've got to think about the scale in order to make sure that the auditing costs are proportionate to the savings that are going to be made. Finally, I think it has the real potential to drive new models. You've heard what AC's just talked about in terms of the Olio app. There are other redistribution organizations that could really benefit from this particular approach. So I think it does have, but we've got to try and find a way of making it simply work and make it as efficient as possible. But the critical thing is this is a real opportunity to actually bring new financing into tackling food loss and waste. That's great. Great. Well, 
what about uh, the risk of greenwashing here? I think um, that's always a risk in any industry and uh, feels like a, a big one here. I can, <clears throat> there's a number of things that we can do in order to prevent this and uh, there's initiatives that I'm gonna tell you about that are doing this. But first and foremost, when you, if, if you decide that your project can benefit from this, look for standards that are and continues that have built into their processes, continuous revisions and updates. Why? Because the, the carbon market is a relatively new market, and therefore it needs to keep maturing and growing, and it benefits from this. And if it is not in it, you know, it means that it's not being transparent or, or it's strong enough. So look for those processes that are continuously updating and participate in those too, because as, the as a global community that it's conscious about these problems, you can participate in these processes. That's one. And the second um, is two initiatives I'm going to tell you about that are, were designed and are operating right now that were designed specifically to tackle greenwashing and false claims from companies. The first one is the ICBCM, <laughs> this Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, and the VCMI, which is the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrative Initiative. And sorry for the long jargony uh, acronyms. The first one, the ICVCM, is designed to tackle and regulate the supply side of the market. So to regulate standards like VERA that create and generate this carbon credits, that certify this carbon credits, by putting core principles that they have to follow. And VCMI is in charge of, of uh, generating codes of practice and transparency that companies have to follow so that their claims are actually real. And so when you look for, to participate in these markets, look for standards that follow these core principles from the ICBCM and for companies whose claims align with these codes of practice from the BCMI. And other things that are readily available uh, and more user-friendly are, for example, um, carbonoffsetguide.org uh, or offsetguide.org, where you can find information for free that explains things that you can access information with more knowledge. And companies like Silvera, that in a very user-friendly uh, way, um, they score carbon credits and they tell you the story behind each project so that you approach with a lot of knowledge and you can easily see what is better and what is the most convenient for you as a company to invest or as an individual to invest. Great. I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on the greenwashing potential and, and ways to avoid it. I mean, I'll just go back to the point. We've got to make sure it's conservative. Absolutely, we're not overclaiming here. It's got to be absolutely the minimum that we can get it to, we can re reproducibly do. So conservative, and it has to be audited, and it's got to be independently audited so that everything that goes on the carbon market is genuinely reductions in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise, it ain't going to work. We had a little baseball analogy in the first panel, and I'm wondering what inning are we in here? I, I, I'm from South America, so I do not know baseball that much. <laughs> Neither do if I. If you can do soccer, which <laughs> for me is football, and, and, and of course I'm gonna I would say, appreciate what, it. Yeah, and what's the cricketing analogy here? I, I'm, I'm trying to think this through. I think, I think, I think the honest answer is, I, I guess we're in the first innings here, aren't we? Uh, when we're starting it, but I, I'm maybe hoping I'm getting this right. It's from the how many innings? Nine. Nine. Oh my God. Well, maybe we're in the third. <laughs> well, as good as third. If okay. it's football, soccer for the U.S., I think we're. Maybe like at the end of the first half? Ah, Maybe. end of the first half. Well, now a soccer analogy I can work I on. I don't know. Yeah. Do uh, do I, I, st I, I personally think this is probably still more in the first 10 minutes. Uh, it, it, is, it is a very young, you know, it's matured a lot though. And we've done, and we, I referred to many standards. We've done a lot of efforts to improve it. And that's why I was mentioning the, cons the continues improvement built into the processes and the feedback, you know, allowing for feedback from the global community, which I think is a spectacular. But um, it's still, there's still a long way to go. There's still a long way to go. But I think these, the, 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 the strength of these tools to unlock crucial financing as we transition away from emission intensive economy is, is, is magnificent. Is there a milestone that you think would take you from uh, the early stage into a, a little bit of a, a next stage or that you're aiming for? Well, the milestone is for offsets not to be needed at all. So if you have companies doing, uh, well, I can't do it anymore. They, they, they're doing this, right? And 
eventually they transition away from emission intensive and we no longer need offsets and we can you know focus on helping them do this then that's that's the milestone right i think that's a really beautiful place to end so <laughs> it's, thank you Dean. it's very opt I, I the optimism at the conference has just been wonderful so thank you and thanks guys thank you everybody thank you, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. What a great discussion. All right, everyone, now we have a 30-minute networking break. Um, so get out there, make some new connections, and don't forget to check your event app. We have lots of virtual attendees that are trying to reach out to you guys and connect, so make sure you have a chance to connect with them as well. Uh, then at 10.30, we en uh, encourage you to join one of the breakout rooms for the Around the Table in 90 Minutes workshop sessions, where we'll roll up our sleeves and really dig into some of these key food waste challenges together. Then we'll break for lunch at noon, and then we're back again at 1.30 for sector deep dives. Then finally, one more net bre networking break, and then finally, something really special that we're excited to have this year at Summit. We'll be turning the stage over to some amazing and inspiring young people to tell you about the work that they're doing to drive food waste reduction in the sector. Um, you don't want to miss it, so we'll see you here soon. Thanks. <laughs>